from the Excellence in Journalism Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, welcome to the Calv Report, hosted by Edward R. Murrow Professor Emeritus at Harvard University, Marvin Kalb. On this edition, Why Morrow Matters in the Digital Age. Our series is produced by the George Washington University, the National Press Club Journalism Institute, Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center, University of Maryland University College, and the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. The Calb Report is underwritten by a grant from Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb and our subject today is Why Murrow Matters in the Digital Age. Many of you know that we usually do our reports from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., but today we're in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for the annual convention of the Society of Professional Journalists and the Radio Television Digital News Association. Where better to ask why Morrow matters in the digital age, the journalists in this ballroom, hundreds of them, face a technological and financial problem. Some call it a crisis, and it's been that way for a while. The result is that journalism seems thinner these days, but its responsibilities have never been, forgive me, thicker. The nation is absorbed with degrees of political deadlock and economic uncertainty, and overseas the world is in dramatic turmoil and danger. Stories are everywhere. Question, can journalism do its job when its budgets are being pinched, staffs are cut, and morale in many places way down? Journalism now needs inspired and imaginative leadership. It could also use a new Ed Murrow. But where is he or she? I confidently predict that our panelists will provide the answers. <laughs> and let me introduce Casey Murrow, Ed's son. He's executive director of Synergy Learning, a nonprofit that supports math and science teachers. He has co-authored books on elementary and preschool education, including two series supported by the National Science Foundation. He's taught at the University of Vermont, and he is the executor of the literary estate of his father, the legendary Edwin R. Murrow. Bob Edwards hosts The Bob Edwards Show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio and Bob Edwards Weekend, distributed by Public Radio International. For 24 plus years, he hosted NPR's Morning Edition. He's won many awards, including his 2004 induction into the Radio Hall of Fame. He's the author of Edward R. Murrow and the Birth of Broadcast Journalism. Aaron Moriarty is a lawyer and a CBS News correspondent, who's also received many prizes, including nine Emmy Awards and one Overseas Press Club Award. She's covered just about everything, from the death of Princess Diana to the war in Iraq. She joined CBS in 1986 after working for affiliates in Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Baltimore, and Cleveland. And finally, Dean Baquet, who was managing editor of the New York Times after stints as its national editor and Washington bureau chief. He was also the editor of the Los Angeles Times, and before that, a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He's been there, in other words, and done it. Okay, panelists, our theme, why Murrow matters in the digital age, but let's start with a simpler question. Why Murrow matters at all? Why is it that every news organization earnestly seeks a Murrow prize of some sort or another? Why is it that so many journalists pattern their professional lives after Murrow? Why is it that when offered the chance, I name my professorship at Harvard, the Edward R. Murrow Professor of Press and Public Policy, certainly the highest honor I will ever receive. Why Murrow matters. 
obviously because he was so very <coughs> special, but that's only the beginning of an explanation. And I want to start with Murrow's son, Casey. How would you answer that question? Well, I would answer it in the past tense, first of all, because he was a wonderful father and, uh, uh, and one who set standards that, uh, uh, that I, I believe in and appreciate uh, even today. And in the, in the current era, why does he matter? Um, I think, again, because of the, of the standards that he believed in and, and managed to achieve most of the time uh, as, a, as a reporter, <coughs> and um, that I think he uh, was able to um, inculcate in a lot of other folks as well uh, as, uh, as they began their careers, at, in his case, with CBS. Were you aware at the time, Casey, that your father was having such an impact upon his profession and the nation? Not as a young kid, no. My parents were very careful to, uh, to, to not let me get stuck in that, uh, what would be a rut, I think, for a, for a kid. Um, I simply knew the family as it was and, uh, um, and wasn't clear until I was in my teens, really, of, of what Dad had done. And uh, the, the current phraseology is quality time. He was very busy. Were you ever able to get that quality time? Uh, yes, in strange um, chunks. We did a lot of fishing together. We did hunting together. <laughs> um, uh, he taught me how to paddle a canoe. So he took, he took chunks of time off when, uh, uh, when I did get to spend significant time with him. Aaron, you work at CBS. I once worked at CBS for 24 years. Ed worked at CBS, of course, same network, same question, really. How would you define, as a CBS correspondent, the Murrow legacy? It was almost like the perfect storm. We got to mm. see him in action because of television and hear him in radio. Um, he was this person who, who took on a, an iconic figure at the time, um, and there, weren't, there wasn't the noise that exists now. What do you um, mean by that? Well, I mean, there were three networks. There were some newspapers. You really saw him now. I, there, I believe there are Murrows out there, but it's hard to see them because there's mm -hmm. so much going on. But he, he represents in some ways an ideal, um, uh, what we all should be as reporters, um, but the fact that he was a human being um, and we got to see his personality, it also made it something that we could achieve then too. It wasn't just an ideal, it was a human person as well. Bob Edwards, author of one of the really good Murrow biographies, we know that Murrow mattered, but from your own research, observation, why, how? He professionalized what we do. I mean, news was done on radio before Murrow. News was done on television before Murrow, but it was done by announcers. It was done by people who also covered parades and beauty contests. They were jacks of all trades. What Murrow did was devote himself and his his associates, the fabulous, fabulous staff that, that he hired, strictly on news, and they were professionals. He set the highest standards very early. Man, when you can start an industry with the best uh, and have those standards laid down, uh, including motive. Why do you do the news? For what reasons do you do the news? Are you serving an audience? Or, or, you know, are you doing this for commercial advantage? Are you doing this to make money for William Paley? Um, and he had uh, the courage of his convictions. He was fearless, set that example uh, up against McCarthy, up against William Paley when that was necessary, and paid the ultimate price. He's a hero. He's a martyr. He is, and he's also introduced the element of... Professionally a martyr, I mean. Yes, I know, but also ethics. He yes. also, in the very definition of what you're saying, introduced the concept of ethics into journalism. And doing, yes, doing everything for the right reasons. You talk about fair and balanced. He was uh, quite fair. Balance he didn't care for. Uh, <laughs> balance, to, to, say bal to have balance is to say all arguments are equal. He would not bring a liar on to balance the truth. Uh, he would investigate, very thoroughly investigate, and then come down with what he had learned. And that was it. Terrific. Dean, you're our newspaper man here. <laughs> and does Murrow, a radio and television man, matter to you? I think even more so now um, for a ton of reasons. First off, 
the news business in general, from newspapers to the internet to television, is undergoing the same kind of revolution that it probably was undergoing at the time he first became an iconic figure. I think that the yeah. ethics of the news business is being challenged like never before, partly because, to be frank, some, our sins are more evident, the mistakes we make, um, which I think is a healthy thing, by the way, the mistakes we make are more evident, um, partly because there are, there are new players in the industry who, while I think they are bringing terrific things to the industry, may not know all of the history. I think we're in the middle of a, of a, of a significant revolution in news gathering, um, in the way news is presented, in the very definition of a reporter. So I think to have, to have a figure who's sort of a North Star who helps set a definition for what a reporter should be, for what the ethics should be, is probably even more important now than 25 years ago. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. Um, Casey, I want to test your objectivity. Um, when you turn on the television these days or listen to the radio, do you see or hear any reporter who measures up to your dad? Oh, that's a nasty question. <laughs> um, I want to agree with Aaron because I think there are, there are many people who are doing very, very exciting work. I don't think people have the opportunity to get <coughs> programs on the air um, in the way uh, my dad did. He had, um, he had access to CBS as a corporation in ways that, that people don't today. Um, and he probably uh, had access to people who are willing to take some risks, or, or in some cases, lots of risks, um, beyond what they may be willing to take mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So identifying that, if we were to look for a person, I, it seems to me that's, that's extremely hard okay. uh, in this day and age. I got a question for Bob and for Aaron, and this has been mentioned earlier. In 1958, Murrow delivered a very important speech, probably the most important of his life. He proposed, among other things, that the network set aside an hour of prime time on Sunday, not every Sunday, but often enough, to discuss a major issue facing the nation, whether that be the economy, the Middle East, or education. He said of television that it can teach, it can illuminate, yes, and it can even inspire, but he added, it can only do so to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. Otherwise, he concluded, television is only wires and lights in a box. So Bob, has television news lived up, even in part, to Murrow's hopes? I think there's a lot of great television, and, and television does a fabulous job of, of journalism on a breaking story. Um, they're all over it, and they're able to be in places they were never mm -hmm. able to be before uh, with all this marvelous technology, and to cover the story better than, than you know, at least from a technical standpoint, than uh, Murrow's people could. But the rest of the time, I worry about it. Uh, it becomes the, the, the you know cable cable news networks have gun shout shows in prime time or uh, celebrity interviews or whatever. Where is the journalism there? Why is it just one great breaking story that's covered to death when the routine should be investigative reporting, uh, what corporate America is up to? how lobbyists write our laws, all of that sort of thing should be exposed every day of our lives. And you're putting that within a context of the rise of cable, but Newt Minow, way back in 1962, made the point that if you sat down for 24 hours, and that was the challenge he put to the people listening, he said if you watch television for 24 hours, you would describe it as a vast wasteland. So even back then, there were the seeds of that <clears throat> negative impression. Right, what Murrow was arguing for was one hour a week. One hour. Oh, we get that now with, with cable, but he was asking for just one hour. Television could not break away from the cowboy shows of the time, the crime shows of the time, the sitcoms, the variety shows, for just one hour. Uh, it seemed to me a very modest request. And but he didn't get it. <laughs> no. 
Aaron, would CBS hire Murrow today? Well, that's an interesting question, but I, I want to disagree with Bob a little bit because 60 Minutes is on every week, and I would argue that that often 60 Minutes is great journalism, and most of the time it's not breaking news. It's usually putting things in perspective. And the other thing I found, now I think it's just tough to find good television. It is, there is a wasteland out there, but um, I've been an Emmy judge, and when you take a look at the documentaries that appear on television, um, I'm sometimes embarrassed. I'm, I'm thinking, why didn't I see this? There's a lot of good stuff out there, wonderful uh, reporting, but it's hard to find today. Um, the, how you define Edward R. Murrow, whether he would have to be probably good looking for CBS no, I'm at first. I'm talking about no, but I'm the just Edward saying, R. Murrow that we know. Would CBS hire him today? Today, this CBS would. Under Jeff Fager, I actually think would. Um, what do you think he would be doing? He'd probably be working for 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> From the Excellence in Journalism Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, this is the Kalb Report. Why Moral Matters in the Digital Age. The series is produced by the George Washington University, the National Press Club Journalism Institute, Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center, University of Maryland University College, and the Philip Merrow College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Once again, Marvin Kalb. Dean, it's been said that the New York Times represents the gold standard of print <laughs> journalism with all of the problems, finances, and that. How do you maintain that high standard these days in a world of, of digital media? First off, we're, <clears throat> we're fortunate. The primary reason is that we're fortunate to be controlled by a family um, that cares more about the quality of the newspaper and its future than anything else. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that's not just a patriotic gesture to keep my job. That's, that, that, in fact, is true. I mean, yeah. I think if the... If the New York Times were to, to listen to the market, um, it would not be what it is today. It's really difficult now to, be, to put out a quality news report that, that does what the, the web demands, and, and that would, that's what good about, that is what is good about the web, but also that does what print demands. It's really difficult. It what means, are the specific pressures that you work under? Um, I mean, I'll give you, as a reporter 20 years ago, if I covered a story, I'll be very, I'll be pretty granular. If I cover, if I covered a press conference at 10 a.m., I could go back to the office. I could make phone calls. I could come to understand it. Um, I could write a story at seven o'clock that captured the result of a lot of reporting. The White House reporter for the New York Times or the Washington Post or or any print medium, and I'm talking about print because that's what I know, goes to cover the press conference at 10, has to file at 1010, if it's important, um, has to then write again at 1130 when somebody updates it or somebody responds to it, um, maybe even one more time. And then by the end of the night has to start thinking about what kind of story is going to be analytic enough and smart enough to feel fresh to the print reader in the morning. And most newspapers, by the way, we're fortunate to be doing it with a staff that's the same size. A lot of papers are doing that with staffs that are half the size, a third the size. I would say, by the way, if you ask me the same question about newspaper journalism that you asked about print journalism, I would say that newspaper journalism is significantly weaker today as a rule than it was five or six years ago. I would say that the demands of the market um, on newsrooms and the, and the resulting cuts in some of the great big American newspapers um, have hurt their ability to do what they even used to do. And to do what I just described has gotten to be almost impossible for a lot of newspapers. I think newspapers, what I think is great, by the way, is that I think that the best of what we're seeing in the web, the best of what we're seeing in this sort of nascent journalism is making up for some of that, though. Well, it's interesting. There's a recent Pew study um, saying that an increasing number of print executives have said that in roughly five years, many newspapers in the U.S. may be able to offer a print copy only on a Sunday and perhaps a couple of days during 
the week. Are you one of those executives who think I, that? I, I think I, 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 there's no doubt that's the future for a lot of print papers. It's already started. I mean, the New Orleans paper where I started is going to print three days a week. Um, Sunday is the day that most newspapers make all their money. I think it's inevitable. I think most, many papers, I don't think that will be the true of the New York Times, many papers will not print seven days a week. That's a, so that that's a guess from somebody who knows at least about, less about the business side, but it feels <laughs> inevitable. No, but I don't want to misunderstand you. Are you saying that you think even the New York Times? No, no, I think not the New York Times. Not the New York Times. But I think a lot of regional newspapers that are more economically challenged, that don't have ways to generate huge income in their websites, um, that don't have national advertising, that are dependent on local ad sources that are dwindling, I think you'll see a lot more of those papers shrink to two, three, one day a week print. Does the Times, both print and digital, make any money? Yes, oh yeah, yeah. The New York Times, print is still where the New York Times makes most of its money. But the New York Times, as a newspaper and a newspaper operation, still does make money. Yes. You know, it's interesting. There's another study by the Newspaper Association of America, which says that newspapers have lost $798 million in print in the first six months of 2012 and made only $32 million in digital right. in that same period of right. time. I mean, if those numbers are right, how do you project uh, print newspapers 5, 10, 15 years from now? Well, first off, if you back up a little bit before we start to, to begin the death knell for newspapers, mm. 25 years ago, print newspapers made unbelievable amounts of money. I mean, just had un staggering profit margins. Um, they were the dominant ways to advertise in their, in their cities. Um, so they were making tons of money. I think they, prop, they were, all, we were all too slow to ad adapt to an era in which we suddenly had a lot more competition. I mean, selling an ad at the Los Angeles Times of 25 years ago, I, I'm not being facetious, meant going out to play golf with the ad exec for Paramount Films. They said, we got 10 great movies coming out. They said, great. We'll have ads. That's the, that era is, it was easy. is gone. It was easy, yeah. um, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating how easy it was. It's really hard now. Um, I think that it's going to require much more of a public service belief on the part of newspaper executives, some of whom I think have shown um, Sam Zell. I hope you're listening. Have shown that they have they don't have a public service fiber in their bodies. Some of whom. Don Graham, Arthur Sulzberger, do have a public service mentality and belief. And I think that's, what, that's going to make a huge difference in the future of newspapers. I want to take a brief moment now to remind our radio and television audiences that this is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb. Our subject is why Murrow matters in the digital age. And our panelists are Casey Murrow, Bob Edwards, Aaron Moriarty, and Dean Baquet. Casey. Many more people today are getting their news from the internet than they are from the mainstream media, the old CBS radio and television. May I ask where you get your news from these days? Probably half from the internet and uh, a very high percentage from NPR. And in the internet, where do you go? What, what sorts of uh, websites? I, I am uh, I'm somewhat addicted to the New York Times website. Um, but I realize that's th there are there are faster sources of, of things. No, one that's can, enough. The one can watch <laughs> that. <laughs> the rest is sort of so that, Yeah, I just hunt around a little bit. Fine, really. I don't really go anywhere else. Yeah, good. Aaron, where do you get your news from? Um, I start in the morning on the internet. Absolutely, and because the Times comes to my, that's the first place I look. Um, if there's a story that really interests me, then I'll get off on Google and start looking. Um, but I never miss morning television as well because I, as a television person, I need the pictures too. Um, and so then I flip on. Now I have to admit, I whether it's radio or television, I use it as radio in the morning because I'm running around. But the first place I have to say, I start the internet. Bob, for you? 
Uh, still NPR and uh, CNN and uh, the Washington Post has been my local daily newspaper since 1971. It's a shadow of its former self, but it is still a great, wonderful newspaper. Yep. And when you say the internet, I want to be clear about this. What is it? Casey was saying the internet meant for him largely, I don't want to misstate, the New York Times web First page. choice. First choice. Um, Aaron, what would be on the internet? Where do you go? Well, because the New York Times is right on my email. So that's the first place I oh, go I because I have it sent to me. Um, and, that's my paper that I've always been right. addicted to. And the internet for you means what? Uh, the Washington Post. Uh, the same on, on, on the web. NPR and CNN. That's, I don't know why, but that's where I go. There. <laughs> <laughs> and Dean, you? Uh, all over the place. Um, I mean, that's stuck. Where do you, where do you no, start? No, no, no. I'll, I'll be I'll be more specific. I, I, m where I start depends on the biggest story of the day. Uh, okay. Um, if the, in the middle of a campaign, I will I've put aside the New York Times because I will have looked at it the night before and then the memorized morning. Memorized it. At, right. Um, I look at the Washington Post. I look at Politico. Um, hmm. If there's a big foreign story. Um, I'll look at The Guardian first. Um, I mean, it, it really depends on, on the story. If it's a big economic story, I'm more likely to look at the journal and the, I look at all the networks online. I mean, it's a, a ton of stuff, and a lot of it depends on the big story of the morning. For someone like you, it is professional homework uh, to yes. read up on stories. Yes. yes, You want to find out how the competition is done. Yeah. Uh, other big stories that you might have to pursue that yeah. day. Yeah, you want to see different perspectives. I mean, I find The Guardian extremely valuable. First off, they're in a different time zone. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's a very different kind of news organization. I find it valuable. I find the networks valuable. So I have to look at every, everything. Yeah. Let me ask you all about a letter that was sent recently by six major journalism foundations. They were urging journalism schools to radically change their ways. They want top <coughs> journalists to teach and to live on campus, and students and professors to focus on applied research. Too much theory, not enough practical training seems to be their underlying message. They issue a thinly veiled threat that if the journalism schools do not recreate themselves, they may not get any more money, which is um, a questionable aspect of that letter, and I hope that I'm misreading their intent. But what I would like to know, Casey, and I'll start with you here, because you deal with curricula quite often. You're dealing with students all the time. How does that sound to you? Um, can you recreate a journalism school uh, in this manner? Well, I, I only heard about this uh, idea this morning from the point of view of journalism and journalism schools, um, but it, uh, it rang a bell right away because um, schools of education are being told the same sorts of things by foundations. I think a lot of it is a, a message from foundations about their um, strength, in a way, and their ability to, to call some shots that they perhaps haven't, haven't uh, mm. exercised before. Um, I don't, in, in terms of journalism schools specifically, I really don't know uh, how, how that would work out, but it does seem to me to be a, a somewhat remarkable set of demands, um, particularly presented as a letter, but that was my... But in, in the education schools, for example, what is the intent of the foundation? Well, the, uh, an interesting problem is that, is that in a letter like that, they're actually right in terms of education. I mean, education schools are usually quite behind the times. They're not, uh, they're not always teaching um, what they could uh, to prepare students for immediately entering classrooms. I'm guessing that in journalism that could be true, too, um, but, uh, but I'm not an expert in that. Aaron, if it was your job at CBS to hire young journalists, would you want them to be graduates of this practical, down-to-earth, applied model of journalism school? Well, yeah, I, th I think I would. I would definitely want that, but I would also want... I didn't go to journalism school mm -hmm. because uh, I'm a lawyer and I went to law school, but it strikes me as the one place that you get a time to really think about what you're doing because we don't get time day-to-day -to, -day to think about mm -hmm. what we're doing when we run into an ethical 
situation. We have to deal with it on the fly. So the idea that you might be able to deal with those things in journalism school, I wouldn't want to see that lost. But um, yes, I would want to see, because one of the advantages, a couple of things with practical, is that they may run into a very real ethical situation that they have to deal with with a story while they're in school, and so I'd want to see that. And also because there's so many stories now um, that are happening where you could, in these schools, they're almost <laughs> like the, um, you know, on the front lines of some stories. Um, when Aurora happened with the university right there, um, when you have Virginia Tech, sometimes the very first information you get because there is so much technology. Um, I would like to think that the journalists who are covering it, these young students, are really learning the practical part of it and not suddenly caught off guard. Yeah, there may be the danger that you can reach or lean too far in the direction of technology and then lose sight of what it is that Absolutely. you're there in the first Absolutely. place to do. Bob, Roger Ailes, I don't know if you know, but the president of Fox. Fair and balance. <laughs> he, recently, he recently suggested to journalism students at the University of North Carolina, in your shoes, I go into a new line of work. Now, Roger Ailes is a notorious jokester, and he might have been kidding, though I don't think so. And I'm wondering, why do you think he would say such a thing, not reading his mind here, but to talk to journalism students and raise a doubt? Why? I would not begin to <laughs> try to read the mind of Roger Ailes. Trying to discourage young journalists from entering the field? Um, either that or telling them they're in the wrong line of work. Or he's raising a question, really, in his way, that there are so many problems now in journalism. Why bother to go into that industry when you could be a lawyer, for God's sake? <laughs> I mean, your father would be so proud of you. Well, <laughs> leaving Roger aside, I would tell young people there are certainly more lucrative professions. <laughs> Uh, but nothing more fun nothing and more nothing fun. more important ultimately to uh, an informed electorate. Uh, by being a good journalist, you're participating in the governance of your country and serving a, a very important role. And it's just, it's fun. It's the dirty little secret. It's fun. Dean, as you know, there is now a believability rating, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. And according to a Pew study, ever since 2004, when the Times began to be included in that study, what they say is the believability of the Times has dropped 13 points. Now, first, do you believe that <laughs> believability? I, I actually don't, the, though I do think the, the, there's no question the believability in the media has dropped some. I'm not, I'm not sure I, I'm not even sure I can contemplate how they how they got to that point. I mean, I, I will say a couple of things about um, trust in the media. First off, there's greater scrutiny of the media, which I think is healthy, having, having, been, having been beaten up a couple of times um, and having not liked it, I still think it's healthy. It's what we do. I don't, think, I don't think we can complain about getting beat up when we essentially have a business model that depends on beating people up. Um, so, so I think it's probably healthy. I think, I think it's also it's the result of another good thing, which is that um, we are much more open. People can see our mistakes much more. Partly that's because of the web. We make them fast. We try to fix them after. We make them fast. We, tr we try to be more transparent. And then I think there's one really bad thing, which is I think that there's a, and I, and I would put a lot of this on, institutions like Fox News, to be frank. I think there's a, there are some news organizations that thrive on division um, and that would, that would prefer to sort of beat the other guy up than do its own independent reporting, and I think that's contributed to it. But I think to be, all of those things combined. But to be combined. fair to Fox here, mm -hmm. I think you're talking about evening Fox, where yes. you have very yes. opinionated yes, anchors. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But during the day, they are more or no, less I'm, it's, you're, straight. No, you're right to correct me. I mean, but I, let's I, say for a second that this believability rating on the Times dropping 13 points is right. Mm -hmm. Might that have something to do with falling revenues, cutting staffs? For example, when you were at the LA Times, you got an order 
to cut a staff that you didn't like, you thought it excessive, and you quit. Right. Or left, anyway. Um, could that be the reason why people, I mean, you sure. ticked off it's a couple of people. Sure, people. that's a big, that's part of it. I think news, and again, I, forgive me, I'm speaking about print, because right. I, I don't know. I think print organizations are weaker than they used to be. I think they're less in communities. I think they're less visible to people. I think they're, I, I don't know how you could, I mean, I think the LA Times is a terrific newspaper and I have tremendous respect for it, but I, I don't see how you could not, or the Washington Post, um, I don't see how you could not say they're not weaker because they're half as big. Exactly. And I think anybody who says, any, anybody who says you can be just as good with half as many Stop. journalists is just ridiculous. Right. That's a ridiculous Bob, I'd like your view on this believability rating and wondering whether you feel it might have something to do with the polarization of our politics as well. I, th I think some of the slime sticks after a while. Mm. Uh, this has been a concerted campaign against us since at least Agnew and Nixon. And uh, it's been relentless. It's picked up steam again and again. It's turned out to be, uh, I guess, still a winner for them. Uh, on through, you know, Sarah Palin and the mainstream media. And I think ultimately some of the slime just sticks and... <coughs> Uh, and people who don't give this a whole lot of thought or who have independent judgment are willing to be um, uh, led into sharing those views. And we have the phenomenon of people watching Fox who are by nature conservative politically and feel that the truth is what they're getting on Fox. So when they... And on the, the other side, or, too. Right. I'm sorry? And on the other side, too. Liberals... Yes, will, yeah, yes. So what I'm saying own. is, but that accounts for this uh, increasing distrust of the media overall, and I think there was, Aaron was telling me about a recent poll that says, what, Aaron, 60 percent of the American Six people have Six out of ten increasing. Americans have little or no trust in the media, which is about the highest numbers they'd seen mm. in a Gallup poll. Very concerning, but I think it is has a lot to do with the polarization, too, that you don't trust certain people because they're not expressing the views you believe, you believe in. It. It's also, by the way, the, the, that same trust factor is true of all sort of big organizations. I mean, there's also been a significant drop in trust in politicians, big corporations, yes. et cetera. I think there's a part of this is part of it is reflective of a changing view of America. I'm society. just disappointed because it used to be lawyers were at the very bottom. <laughs> so I thought I was moving up. You sure they're not? <laughs> well, now, both, both well, the you're a twofer. So you're <laughs> but you know, in, in this new digital world, which is expanding rapidly as the old world of print shrinks, I'm wondering if we're seeing the development of two standards for judging editorial content, like one standard for print newspaper and one standard for its website. Um, and I ask the question because you can often see comments online about an online article. Mm -hmm. If you imagine that that same article appeared in the print edition, it would not necessarily make letters to the editor. It seems to be um, on the website at a lower level. And I'm wondering if that inherently creates a danger that you're creating two standards of broadcast journalism. How does that strike you? Um, I don't buy it. Um, I don't think you would. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that readers are sophisticated enough to understand that the website of a news organization, by its nature, is, is going to have more, a little bit more sloppiness by its nature, because I think that I do think that people understand that phenomenon of the press conference at 10, the story at 11. There's not quite the expectation that it would be as sophisticated or perfected as the thing that goes in the. I don't think that means there should be a different standard. I mean, the standards of being being honorable, being true, um, playing it straight. Um, being as fair as possible, I think that holds. I could, and in fact, I think if, if anything, I think that the web forces us to think even harder about it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I, you, I gave you the example earlier of the, 
of the day that the Supreme Court made its decision about um, the Obama health care plan. And we had a conversation the night before in which we all said, we are not going to be first online to explain what this decision is because we know what these things look like. We're not going to understand it. And we need to write a note to the readers that say, dear readers, we're not going to be first. We're not going to put up anything until we understand what this thing is. And we did, and we were late, but I think we, we got it righter than most people. So no. And second or first, get it right. <laughs> right. Well, in that case, I think that was, I think getting it wrong in that case would have been big, devastating big for, the, for the integrity of our website and would have set it back a long ways. I don't think there should be any tolerance for the difference. I mean, a newspaper required you, a, a, a writer of a letter to an editor, to sign your own name and have an address in many cases so that people can go to your home. I mean, you think twice about you know, writing that letter. Right. Online, you know, somebody named Dogface from Arkansas <laughs> can say anything he wants about... He writes to you too? Yeah. <laughs> and there are no consequences, and it can be outrageous and libelous and anything. You know, it's, it's okay, because it's online. I know. Bob, do you wrong. use Twitter? No, I wouldn't know how to. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to tweet. Do you have a blog? Uh, I have a blog I don't... I have an opportunity to blog. What does that mean? But, uh, I mean, I have a site. The show has a site, and I could run my mouth if I wanted to. I just choose not to, only on rare occasions. Aaron, I'm, I'm told fan. that... I'm told that... <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting there. I'm told that you use Facebook. Well, actually, regularly to engage your viewers. I do, um, but I don't like Facebook very much. But I don't. So why do you use it? Too? Um, well, because what I like is the interactivity of it. Um, during our show, our show airs on Saturday nights live. It's 48 hours. 48 hours, and that's the show I'm assigned. I also report for other shows, but that's the one that people really connect to me with. And I can go on live, and not only do I sometimes get amazing remarks about the show, things I didn't think about, but we get very um, interested viewers. People become very uh, connected and invested and invested in me. And there's, I, I, that part I like about Facebook. Most of the time, though, Facebook just seems to be so much noise. What I do love is Twitter. Um, I do. Um, I Why? think that during a big event, um, and this actually can enhance broadcast news. In a big event, people are connecting and they want to talk about it. Um, and they're actually watching television more if they can be tweeting at the same time. I use it as a news service for people I believe in. Mark Knoller is, I always like Mark Knoller. He is um, the White House radio correspondent. If you don't know him, you for should CBS. Be, yes, for CBS News, sorry, CBS News Radio. You should follow him on, on Twitter, and here's why. He is also a White House historian. And every single morning, he's one of the first people I go to. I look at him on Twitter in the morning because I learned something from him. And um, I think Edward R. Murrow would have used Twitter. I do because it can amplify an important story. Um, David Polk of The Times, he will post something on Twitter that I might have passed over on the New York Times or somewhere else. Um, so I'm sorry, you just I love Twitter as a news service. I don't tweet as much because I don't <coughs> sometimes think I'm smart enough to do it. I like really good tweets. It's 140 characters. Um, what you put on there should be really important. But um, I'm a big fan. From the Excellence in Journalism Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, this is the Calb Report. Why Moral Matters in the Digital Age. The series is produced by the George Washington University, the National Press Club Journalism Institute, Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center, University of Maryland University College, and the Philip Merrow College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Once again, Marvin Kalb. With all of the new technology, social websites, Twitter, and God knows what else, what I'm finding is that local radio and local newspapers and local television is where most people still find the greatest source of comfort. And there's a study that says as many as 72% of the American people, when questioned, will tell you that when they want to go for news, they'll go to a local source rather than a national source. 
Now, that doesn't say very much positive about the national source. I can understand a figure of 30 percent, 40 percent going local, but 72 suggests either that there's something magnificent and special about local or something quite repellent about national. And I'm just wondering what you guys think. Casey? Well, I, I'm not sure in the, uh, in the modern era, but as you were speaking, I was thinking of the fact that, uh, that the affiliates would sometimes drop See It Now, um, uh, drop that feed from the network if they didn't like the topic. Um, or what they thought the topic was going to be. Yes. And it seems to me that's, that's a, a 1950s version of, of the same sort of thing, of, of seeing um, the, the local um, outlet, whatever it may be, as a, uh, a safer source or, or one where I might see my cousin or my uncle um, in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I, I, the, the national stuff might not grab people in the same way. Too bad. Aaron, what do you think? I don't think it says anything terrible about national. The problem is much of national news comes from New York. And I travel for a living. And even though I'm an Ohioan and very much Midwesterner, people, when I come in, they'll go, oh, you're a New Yorker. You may not understand. I think it's more this <laughs> idea that those New Yorkers or someone from L.A. may not understand the problems mm -hmm. of local. And mm -hmm. you trust someone who's grown up. Um, and you forget that most of these people who are covering national news came from the Midwest, came from all over the country. But mm -hmm. I think that's really what it is. It's, you just want to hear from somebody who's more like you, who talks like you do. Mm -hmm. Bob, what's your sense of this? I, I'm, I keep thinking of a famous Murrow quote. I mean, he was dealing with new media. Radio and television were new in his time. And the technology could finally uh, have you speak to the other end of the country. And he famously said, just because the new technology uh, allows you to speak to the other end of the country, it gives you no more wisdom than you had when your voice only reached the other end of the bar. <laughs> I still think that's true. It's content. That's what he's saying. Content. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you can have all the technology in the world, but if you have nothing to say, it's useless. <laughs> So the quality of your message, Dean. I think lo I think people would find local news more trustworthy, and in, and in some way, I mean, local news is, you know, your taxes, your local taxes, how your school system is doing, how your mayor is doing. You know, seventy percent of local issues are not right-left issues the way people see war and presidential elections as right-left issues. They're sort of bread and butter issues, the closer they are to home, the more you can tell, the, more you, the fewer questions you have about it. There aren't epic um, philosophical battles over, um, I mean, there are some, but there aren't epic philosophical battles over who should be the next mayor. They're more bread and butter. I think, I think that's, I don't, I'm not sure that says as much about national news as much as it says about the tenor of national issues versus the tenor of local issues, to be honest. That it would be, in your judgment, a more natural thing for a person to be interested in stuff closer to home. Yeah, we, I mean... Look, so that we can't read too much into that. I don't think so. I think national issues, by their nature, carry with them a certain amount of controversy. People understand them less. They seem a little bit vaguer. Um, they're far away. <clears throat> I'm wondering also whether it could be an issue that we were just glancingly touching on earlier about the nature of the, the polarization of politics and the way in which that affects so much of our judgments about other things as well. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to think about the New York Times, and I don't want to stress the Times here, but large national news organizations right. are, as being in the clutch of some leftist gaggle. And you've got to be very careful about that. And that may be around the country um, as well. What I would like to do as a kind of um, concluding question to each one of you, um, because we are running out of that precious thing called time, and I want to start with Casey. Now, Aaron said before that your father would probably use Twitter. Um, in, in his world, were there a Twitter, Edward Amaro would be using it. So do you buy it? 
Oh, yeah, I do buy that um, in, a, in a sort of general sense. Um, <laughs> he, because he was very interested in technology, and, and as Bob pointed out, um, they, were, they were engaged in all new technology uh, as in, in, in his television work, but certainly in his radio work before that. Um, he, he would have said he just was in the right place at the right time for those things to happen, which to some extent was true. Um, but, uh, but yes, he was intrigued by, by uh, technological advances, and so why not today's? Well, what do you think his judgment would be of today's journalism? I always try to avoid that question. <laughs> I, um, I don't, uh, I, I think he would worry about, about many aspects of it, but he worried about so many aspects of what he saw um, when he was alive that um, I, I assume he would continue his critiques in some fashion. I hope so. Aaron, um, at this stage in your career, what is it that inspires you? And I'm asking the question in the following way. A lot of us, when we get up in the morning, you know, you can say, oh, God, another day. But some of us who are involved in journalism have the feeling that there's something special about what it is that we're going to do. What inspires you now? Well, I'm very lucky. I think that um, I cover trials, but I often focus on wrongfully convicted cases. And so I can work years on a case. Um, and what inspires me, what I've got one coming up right now, a young man who had an actual innocence hearing a lot it, it, because of three hours that we've aired on his case and new evidence came out because of it. And if he walks out of prison or at least gets a new trial, I mean, there's nothing that greater. That terrific. inspires me. Bob. Radio, clearly, holy good so, and NPR is doing very well. CBS Radio is doing very well. Murrow loved radio. If he were alive today, what, in your judgment, would, where he, would he be working? Sirius, uh, XM Satellite, or NPR? Oh, I think NPR, because he would have the room, the depth. Without in, any doubt in your mind. Though. Well, Fr Fred Friendly told me that. Ed Bliss told me that. <laughs> so I take their word for it. Okay. Along with 60 Minutes. Along with 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and his Twitter De account. <laughs> <laughs> and Dean, for you, um, how does the Times turn around that believability issue to the degree that it exists? How would you go about it? I mean, you're close to being the big boss now. When you become big boss, how would you handle it? <laughs> um, transparency. I think, I think let, acknowledging when we screw up, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying I got that one wrong. Um, you know, forgive me, I'll try to do it better the next time. But making sure that you don't screw up on the big ones, I use the Supreme Court as an example, um, working really hard not to get the big ones wrong, um, whether it's issues of war and national security, being understanding and embracing our role as being sort of a, a tough counterpoint to government. I think if you do all of those things, I think I can't imagine that your numbers won't go up. And to be frank, even if they don't, that's what you're supposed to do anyway. And would you say that that is something that all news organizations ought to be addressing sure. at this point? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. And no difference between newspapers or print I mean, newspapers or radio, television. No, absolutely. I think all, all, all news organizations should behave that way. The, the, some, of the, some of our screw-ups of the last few years have been healthy for us because it's forced us to sort of own up to our screw-ups and just be open about them and just be transparent about them. Well, um, thank you. Thank you all very much for those uh, observations. I would like to add one thought. We're all dazzled by the digital world, and understandably so, the speed, the access, live cut-ins, instantaneous analysis. It's all truly amazing, but sometimes it's a bit troubling as well. Morrow used the new technology of his era, radio and then television, and both are still here. And today, you are using your new technology, the, the new media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, Hangouts, and probably Hangouts, God knows, other places as well. But I must <laughs> confess that every now and then, 
I worry that we may be losing sight of the fact that technology is only a tool. It's a tool for the dissemination about what we as journalists discover. It can never be considered more important than the content of what we discover in our daily work, hourly work, in fact. A story sometimes that needs telling, a crime, a misdeed, a misjudgment that needs exposing. Journalism is more important today than ever before. I know you've heard that before, but it's true. I also believe that Murrow and what he represented matters more today than ever before. Murrow was a great journalist, in part because he was endlessly curious and remarkably courageous. Are there any Murrows in this audience? We need you to help sustain our democracy and efforts all over the world to build democracy. Good, honest, bold, unafraid, even on occasion, outrageous journalism is essential to democracy. As Burrow once said, this is no time for fear. So young Murrows, rise up. This is your time. Use your tools, use them well, because remember, otherwise, they're just lights and wires in a box. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank our panelists for being here. Thank you to all for looking. Thank you. I'm Marvin Kalb, and as Ed Murrow used to say, good night and good luck. <laughs>